Welcome to the Industry.biz, industry news from industry people. Today's special guest is retired detective David Quinn from the TV One show ATL Homicide. ATL Homicide is a true crime television series that airs on TV One. The show delves into real homicide cases that have occurred in Atlanta, Georgia. It's known for its unique approach as it retells these cases through the perspectives of two retired Atlanta Police Department homicide detectives, David Quinn and Vince Velasquez. The series showcases Quinn and Velasquez as they revisit old cases they worked on, providing insights into their investigative processes and the challenges they faced while working on these crimes. Today, we talk to David Quinn about the show and his perspectives on policing and crime in Atlanta. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and comment on our channel, theindustry.biz. So I've always wondered what it was like. I mean, I I have a fascination with um, these kind of TV shows, First 48, um, you know, Forensic Files, which I actually watched to relax, which is very very bizarre, but (laughs) (laughs) Forensic Files is very therapeutic (laughs) when I'm working. Um, But um, how... uh, what is it like to walk into a scene where somebody's been murdered, knowing that uh, that is a moment in time that's going to change everybody's life around that person? I mean, like the first couple of times you did it, how did you handle that? So in the neighborhood I worked as a patrolman in uniform for years, I saw a lot of murder. Mm -hmm. And I always wanted to peek behind the curtain to see what happens with detectives when they have to interface with those families, with all that loss. When it was my turn, it was an overwhelming responsibility. I can't even go into, I mean, it was, it was gut wrenching because I always tried to keep it spiritual Mm -hmm. and find the mama, whoever raised him or her Mm -hmm. and like connect with them, touch and agree. This is wrong. Here's mm-hmm. my cell phone number. Vince did the same thing. Mm-hmm. That way you don't have to worry about ever answering a voicemail. You're going to talk to me. And that was, that created the legend of David and Vince. Investigative transparency, letting the family and that community in the homicide investigation. Mm-hmm. That's what, to me, yielded all the success. But overwhelming grief yeah. that I still feel today. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I feel honored to have, you know, taken on that grief with them. Hmm. And what is it that we're missing? When we watch TV, you know, they make it look pretty simple, you know, cut and dry. What is it that people you wish that they could also see or hear or uh, grasp when it comes to those kinds of, of environments? What are we missing? Wow. Um, personally, I have a dim view of where law enforcement is going right now. I can only speak for me. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, with the advent of a more militarized, um, a more, um, well, a paramilitary police department presence, Mm -hmm. we've, we've lost the connections. I think what people miss is the real relationships formed work in these murders. Mm -hmm. You need all these people. That mother, and I hate to say it, me and Vince over the years, we've gone back to the same house twice. Oh, wow. When another son or daughter has died. Mm -hmm. And then by the same token, what I think people miss is me and Vince had a relationship with the shooter or the accused family. Oh, wow. Because unfortunately, that mother was going to lose a son, a cousin, a daughter. We're going to see them again. So we hope with everybody's losing. That's what the public miss. It's not sides. Mm-hmm. I, I, countless numbers of time, brother, we would go to court after it's all and said and done. It's time to testify and, you know, put this case up. Mm-hmm. I found myself hugging and embracing the shooter's family on one side of the courtroom and going over and, you know, dealing with the bereaved family, mm-hmm. you know, the family of the victim because, and people started understanding us. Mm-hmm. And I never saw anybody else in our unit doing that. It yeah. was almost like blame the victim. And that's not across the board. I'm just saying a lot of people that trained us or showed us the ropes, it was like a meat market. And I wanted it to be more spiritual. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why people talk to us. Most of these cases were made through confession. For your own sanity, aren't you supposed to disconnect from the emotional uh, concept of that? I don't know how you can do it. Um, mm. My phone rang. I have a very supportive wife who also mm. was a police officer who didn't give a damn that, you know, that's what you wanted to do at 24 seven, that's on you, but you still got to pick up these kids from soccer. You got these clothes to fold. And oh, you're the scout leader. Mm -hmm. you're, your son is sixth grade uh, Boy Scout trooper. I've never even been a Boy Scout. So that's what kept it. The wife kept me straight because mm -hmm. you're losing if you're not answering the phone in homicide. Because mm -hmm. that thing may come, that, that, you know, that linchpin to your investigation might happen at three o'clock in the morning, you got to answer the phone. Mm -hmm. so you, I never disconnected mm -hmm. for the whole time. I was always on. Mm -hmm. That was so, delicate balance. When you walk into a, an environment and like somebody's been murdered, and especially when it's somebody young, um, what is the procedure like uh, in, in, from, from your perspective versus what we see on TV? Of course, they, they rarely show the body. Um, but what is the first thing you look at or you used to look at when you walked into a, uh, an environment like that? What, what, what was your job right away? Well, I want to I wanna go over to my victim. You know, that's a serious time. I want to, you know, say a prayer for him. I don't know what they were doing, whether or not they had a, you know, you know, uh, a half a key of cocaine underneath their arm or whatever was going on at that time, or if they were just walking back to their car and killed. you got to show reverence for the dead. That's number one. Mm -hmm. And you want to identify them. You want to know who they are. Sometimes that's not readily available. Mm -hmm. well, my first thing, I want to look at my victim, and then I want to go from the victim out, mm -hmm. slow. And one thing me and Vince would do, we would wait till everybody left, you know, get everybody out of here. Mm -hmm. I want to be alone with this victim and, and figure and try to think this thing through. What's the last time I'm going to see them? And I want to memorialize that moment by not rushing. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. we're on scenes for 18 hours. Mm -hmm. 18 hours, because you're you looking at everything. You got to go through every dresser drawer, all through the closet. You don't know what you're looking for, you know, diving into the lives of the people that live with this person. Mm -hmm. And me and Vince came on in the year 2000, so it was the advent of technology. You know, mm -hmm. so now you got to get in the brother and the sister's phone. Mm -hmm. um, reverence for the victim. What about the smell? How do you, you deal know, with- the smell, it's, it's not right away. Now, if you get someone that's been laid up, you know, uh, for the last 12 hours, you may, you, you're going to get the passage of time. You're going to get some decomposition. Uh, but the one thing you don't want to do is cover your mouth. You don't want to mm -hmm. put a mask on back in those days. Hmm. You just wanted to, you, 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 your, uh, your olfactory, your, your smell, your senses, you just, innate, you shut it down. Hmm. You shut it down and do the work. Because mm -hmm. the more you put, some people used to put a uh, big salve under the nose. That doesn't right. work. That hmm. just, that intensifies that mm -hmm. smell that no one has ever successfully explained what it's like decomposing flesh. It's, it's not a pleasant thing. Dude, would you say that a majority of the cases that you dealt with involved uh, black people? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm in a chocolate city. Okay. So and what, go ahead. I've only arrested, I arrested one white man working murder for 19 years. Wow. Yeah. What is it that we are not aware of as a community? Because sometimes when you're on a job this long, you become somewhat of a statistician. You know, you see enough of the same thing that you, you draw conclusions about the community, perhaps that we don't want to assess or um, uh, address. What is it that you know that we don't talk about enough? We have a national health hazard in our community. We're talking about black and brown people. Mm -hmm. And that's gun violence. Mm -hmm. Kev, I'm gonna tell you, man, gun violence, it, what the public doesn't see, we just get the murder numbers. Mm -hmm. The number of individuals that receive serious gunshot wounds across mm -hmm. this nation mm -hmm. is staggering and mm -hmm. survive. Mm -hmm. And you couple that with the dead ones. Uh, October 20th of 2020, you know what? Uh, just a few months back, my son had returned from the military a couple of years. Uh, he was working. He went to visit a friend. 
uh, over in East Point, Georgia. Mm -hmm. He was robbed for $200 and shot three times. Oh 26 God. years old. Mm -hmm. Took one in the back. They shattered, you know, his uh, forearm. He had to get a plate. He's got screws all the way through his arm. He, and uh, he was this close to being dead or paralyzed. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, by the grace of God, he's here. And I remember I showed up on, you know, getting a frantic call from some lady uh, on the scene that was going through his pockets and got his phone. I go to the scene. Everybody's like, oh, ATL homicides here. Here's what's interesting. I got horrible police service. Everybody in the on, in, in Metro Atlanta knows who I am. Mm -hmm. And in this neighboring city, I got very horrible police service. Mm -hmm. It was only because their first notion was, well, he must have been down there doing something he had no business. And they know who I am. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, that anyway, we've got to call attention to that kind of BS in our, you know, in our communities. I'm in the process of rectifying a, a few things in that investigation, but I'm up here grieving. My son has COVID going on. My son's in the hospital. I can't go in. And you're asking me, was he buying drugs? You know, he was mm. a paratrooper in the United States Army, you know, overseas jumping out of planes for the government. Mm -hmm. And uh, he gets gunned down. That gun violence, he survived. So his story wasn't even on the news because he survived. Mm -hmm. Three times shot. Um, we got a we, we we've got our own pandemic, and it's with that lead. Mm -hmm. We got to address it because it's got nothing to do with white people, the government, or anything else. It has to do with our community. Mm -hmm. We got to learn how to love each other again, and we got to learn how to resolve our problems without this this gun violence. A lot mm -hmm. of people that never make the stat list that are paralyzed, mm -hmm. lose legs, are changed forever. My son's 26 now; he's using a cane. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. We, we got to deal with that. Mm. That's our community. We got to hold the police mm -hmm. department's feet to the fire to serve us correctly. Mm -hmm. Is I'm that part of the reason why you retired early? Or did you retire early? Because you're still uh, relatively I young. 30, I did 33 years. Okay. I, I retired uh, about a year and a half ago. And, um, you know, I was, I actually stayed three extra years because they were paying a brother. You know, they want to be to take a little contract after I got my full pension. Mm -hmm. I said, let me go ahead and double dip this right quick, see what it feels like to make this kind of money. But I worked harder than I ever worked because I was jumping from cubicle to cubicle as a seasoned vet helping youngins, you know, learn the craft. Mm -hmm. So it wore me out. I was done. Okay. I, I didn't have any more. So how did you have the energy to, because I was reading someplace that you actually, you and your, your partner came up with the idea to do the TV show. How did that come about? Well, what's interesting, uh, there was a producer we met years ago doing an America's Most Wanted episode. Mm -hmm. And I, he, he told me, he said, one day I want to do something with you. Mm -hmm. You know, I, make a long story short, I was on America's Most Wanted. I actually ended up playing myself, which was something they never did. Uh, I guess because a brother was crunk, you know, and he just, oh, you play yourself. Mm -hmm. So the producer, who's now my executive producer, of wide net productions that got all this started. 12 years later, he's like, I'm ready. You're retired. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. And he started shopping around sizzle reels of me and Vin interacting, just being who we are. Mm -hmm. We were turned down by eight or nine networks when TV one took a glimpse and they wanted us and they mm -hmm. wanted us to be us on their network. We okay. were so honored. It was, it was crazy. All honor goes to TV One and that one producer that got that whole thing started just mm -hmm. from one chance encounter on a set of America's Most Wanted. Mm -hmm. I always thought America's Most Wanted was a way to, um, how can I put this, um, to reframe our thinking about, uh, especially in the black community, about police. There was, there was, everything was always so nice. You know, every, everything was always, it looked scripted. Yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. is that generally how it works? Well, the, like the other shows, you know, I've never, I, you know, America's most wanted was, they definitely had a script. They do reenactments. So mm -hmm. that was scripted. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I refused to read the lines. I said, I am the guy. So I'm just going to play me, mm -hmm. you know, on that show. And that was, that was like 2006. Um, I think that the other networks that turned us down to answer your question, 
they wanted us to be something other than what we were. Mm. I, I, you know, I remember one outfit before even we got our uh, show get pitched, you know, wanted me to go out to Nebraska or something and hang out with a forensic technician and some kind of psychic. I said, well, that's just not what I do. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, TV One said, we want what you two, you know, riding together for 19 years. We want that on our network. Mm -hmm. And um, I think people can tell. And see, here's the real test, Ross. It's the people in the street. You know, when they see it and we're active on social media during the show while it's airing, you know, weeks after the show, folks, you know, real people in the street like, yo, Quinn, you represent a UNB. That's just how y'all are. And, and that, that's, that's the biggest reward in this whole deal mm -hmm. is uh, the authenticity. Mm -hmm. So, Was there ever a time that you, your life was in danger? Did you have uh, situations where you had big problems like that? Like I said earlier, I was in the street. For, I grew up on the streets of Atlanta from age 21 to 31 until I went to homicide. Mm -hmm. I swear to you, brother, any neighborhood I went to, because I had you know, worked so many years in the street, it was like going home. It was family reunion. I just didn't have those issues. I, and see, there's another thing I never, if you see a detective works homicide and you can see his gun, he's losing. Mm -hmm. We never saw our guns. We wore suits. We were suited and booted. We wouldn't look like, you know, respectful to people because I always want to be ready if I was going to be giving the worst news to some family member for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go in there with no khakis on, with no golf shirt, sample with guns blazing, looking, you know, looking tactical. I looked like I was going to preach, like I was headed to Mount Carmel or Big Bethel somewhere. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the persona we wanted to, you know, stay professional, you know, look look like I'm hanging out with the nation. You know, I wanted to look like uh, I was about business all the time. He said, why you guys wear dress up every day? Mm -hmm. said, no, because every day could be the worst day for some family. I don't want to see no cartoon character showing up to the living room, breaking their hearts. Yeah. And so three o'clock in the morning, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting, taking a shower, I'm getting suited up, going out. So you would actually go over people's houses at three in the morning? Oh yeah, because you know, we were on call. You know, the city gives you these free cars, so you know. <laughs> when no, I'm saying turn, I'm saying to break the news to the family. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You don't wait. You don't wait. You you want to go ahead and let them get their grieving process going. I don't want to be in a situation where I give a phone call. Mm -hmm. You know, to somebody. You know, I used to see guys in my office do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you, you want to go there. You you want to have the tears in your lapel. Mm -hmm. You know, those are those are you know, those are your medals. You know, mm -hmm. you get that mother's tears in your lapel. Mm -hmm. And and I think keeping it spiritual, it didn't weigh on me where I couldn't sleep. Like I've seen so much stuff, I couldn't even begin to explain to you what I've seen. Mm -hmm. But I, I just kept it open, kept it wide open. Mm -hmm. This isn't my case. This belongs mm -hmm. to the entire community. Hmm. Any particular cases that you, you'll never forget? I mean, well, I'm sure you won't forget all of them, but I'm saying anything that really sticks out well, any case involving a small child and mm. they've been murdered is brutal. Yeah. But I, but I must say, my very last case that was actually assigned to me, not when I came back for three years after doing 30 under contract, most of my murders were kind of transactional. Mm. Somebody wakes up and says, I'm going to get that money. Not that I'm going to kill somebody. I'm going to get that loot. Right. So in route to the cheese, somebody has to die. Right. My last case, brother, I had a serial killer. Oh, wow. I had never had someone that just wanted to kill to get the thrill, the feeling. Like when I finally, we, we captured him uh, last season. We, I'm saying we, we depicted him on ATL Homicide. That, mm -hmm. His name is Eamon Presley. He was the killer. He killed four people mm -hmm. in the space of like four months. And he was getting gratification out of it. The interview I had with him, me and, me and him in that room alone, and we showed it on the show, five and a half hours, and he gave it up. He literally transferred all that evil to me. We were mm -hmm. so close. I didn't even like, I even moved the table. We sat next to each other. Because mm -hmm. it took him a while to get it out, but he gave up all four bodies. And, you know, we ended up getting the gun. That 
is something I had never experienced on my way out the door is my retirement year. Mm -hmm. That brother chilled me. And uh, it's one of the most, it's the longest interview I ever conducted. Five and a half hours, a long time, being in the room, no bathroom break, you know, eating, eating uh, Fritos and Cheetos and stuff with this brother. And um, trying to show him I had love for him. He had father figure issues. And, you know, at the end of the interview, he, he wished I'd been his father. All that was, was strange. Mm -hmm. And then I had, you know, there was the death penalty question, of course. Mm -hmm. And what shocked me was I was against it in the final analysis. And it was time to, because, you know, we have these, you know, they want to get your opinion. And I just think it's, uh, and that's a whole nother subject, but I just think it's, uh, I think we're first in line too much as a community, black and right. brown. People. I think we got to look at that. I have an issue with the death penalty. And um, I sat with his lawyers. I agree with them. And, you know, you should never leave. But uh, I was against the death penalty, have been since then. Mm -hmm. So um, we all, then that means we have another problem in the black community. That's mental health. Yes, sir. Okay. Is that a majority of what you think you come across? I mean, in the prison system and as far as some, a lot of the cases that you come across that there are a lot of un, unaddressed uh, mental health issues that ultimately cause people not to care? Yeah, and I'm gonna tell you from my, I've had people in my family that have suffered with mental illness very close. I think we all have. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you, brother, what was told to me growing up every time you, someone was mentally challenged in some way. We, we got this old wives tale in the black community. Oh, he went to the club when he was young and somebody put something in his drink. Right, right, right. I had a dollar for every time I heard that story growing up about a relative that was faced with those challenges, I'd be rich. Mm -hmm. You gotta let that stuff go. Mm -hmm. It's not no, nobody puts something in somebody's drink. That's, that's just an old, that's some old folklore that, you know, we came up with because we're ashamed of it. Right. I've had to take my relatives and, you know, um, and sit down with them with these, with these therapists, which is the most important part. It's not the dope. Everybody thinks it's the dope that, that, you know, gets people back. You know, I'm talking about the medications they give you, that they give everyone. You've got to have aggressive one-on-one -on -one therapy. It's mm -hmm. the most important component. And we as a community, I would love to get involved with that more because it's touched so many of my family members on both sides. I mean, you have at least one on each side. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you don't want them to fall into the homeless ranks and be out there in the street. We got to get honest about this. Mm -hmm. We don't go get help. What do you think? What is the takeaway that you want people to have from the show? What What is the most important thing that you want to uh, for them to say, I learned this or I got this or I understand this now? Respect. Mm -hmm. And that's what the issue right now is with police departments across the country. You've got to win one neighborhood at a time. Mm -hmm. Every time you step out of that car, you just got to win the neighborhood. And you win that by being there before someone gets killed. Mm -hmm. You win that by being there before someone's car gets stolen. I mean, you got to be part of the community. I, even in the suit, I was always at the neighborhood store, mm -hmm. just like I was when I was in uniform. So I was furniture up in the hood. Mm -hmm. I was just, you know... And everybody didn't have the kind of success that me and Vin had. It's just the truth. Mm -hmm. People, you know, I knew more people than Vin because I've been on the street longer. He'd been out in the world. He, you know, the first, you know, I, I had 10 more years than him because I had been, this is the only job I ever had since the job I started with you. Mm -hmm. That's the only other job, full-time job I ever had. So if they see him with me, we were like, we were like one. People would get us confused for some reason. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. He's Puerto Rican. I'm a brother. So, but a lot of times they get us confused. We gave people access to us. Mm -hmm. The worst thing a cop can ever do is to give a family member, a bereaved person in one of these situations, their desk phone number. Because they'll call you, that family member, you come to work every day, that light will be blinking on your phone with the missed call. And the mm -hmm. message, you give a grieving mama, grandmama, or auntie your cell phone number, they never call you. Why? Because they have access to you anytime they want to. Mm -hmm. And they trust and believe you because the way you hug them, you know, at that uh, breaking of the bad news, they feel like they're part of it. Mm -hmm. We shut 
the, the black and brown communities out of these investigations. I, we used to give up everything on the news. Mm -hmm. Just give it up. We don't, we don't know what it is. Here it is. Here's what happened. Right. So, what do you think? I actually heard a, a preacher say once that you mentioned that you had a couple of situations where you went to somebody's house twice. And he was saying that he knew a woman in Chicago who um, had all three of her sons were killed. And they, they came back one, two, three times. And he couldn't understand why she didn't move. What is the, when people say that kind of stuff to you, how do you respond to that? Yeah, when I hear that, because I was with the indigenous my whole career, I'm going to say most of my life. Mm -hmm. A dollar is hard to come by in America. You know, mm -hmm. people don't understand. It's not easy to pick up and move. You're living in some of the worst neighborhoods and still paying 500 a month. Right. You know, I, I know some people that are just doing whatever they can just to make it, mm -hmm. hoping their rent man doesn't get shut down by code enforcement. All this stress yeah. about, about shelter. There's a mm -hmm. lot of shelter stress out there. Mm -hmm. Why don't they just move? Mm -hmm. uh, they got to be there. And, you know, gentrification in Atlanta you know, just like most cities, is on steroids. Mm -hmm. And consequently, we've got black and brown folks living under bridges. Yeah. Which was something, brother, I never saw when we had the housing projects. Mm -hmm. You know, that uncle was living in a Big Mama apartment. Right. Over there, you know, in the bricks. Mm -hmm. that, that's, Big Mama is not there anymore. They have, they've moved everybody around. Yeah. And well, crack came and killed the concept of Big Mama. That's what happened with that. Yeah. Yeah, but the big mamas, the big mamas became the mamas. I watched that happen. That was a renaissance period in, right. in, 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 in our culture. Yeah. And they were raising that generation. They were raising those grandchildren. Right. They were hanging on. Um, and, you know, we could talk all day about the projects. Uh, the projects, that was, that was some of the safest places to be when I was coming along in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, really? Everybody had a roof. It was it was say it was relatively speaking. I mean, you you had the dope trade. Okay. You, they, they 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 were shooting each other every night, but during the day, you know, older ladies were able to walk to the store with their little wheel cart and get their groceries and everything. And people, dope boys were helping them walk them back home. I mean, I saw. I'm a witness to all that. Uh, things got a little crazier at night, and that's when I usually come to work and. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, our community got left behind with this uh, this race to the top, you know, trying to make everybody live together. We got left behind and a lot of these cities, mine, you know, city of Atlanta included, you know, they left, you know, when they put a new football stadium in, they just don't care. They'll close, they'll, they'll buy a church. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's been there a hundred years. They did that for the Falcons Stadium, the Mercedes Benz, they mm -hmm. bought a church. They've been there a hundred years. Right. Um, we're killing the, these, these pillars. Mm. And uh, Atlanta was a beautiful city when I first came here. With all the crime, it was, it was bad, but it was, it, was, it, was a, it was a cultural icon to me. What year did you come there? Well, I came here in high school in 1978, 79. Yeah, Atlanta was really nice. Well, that was actually Wayne Williams period, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, 81. Yeah. That's when they finally locked him up. That's all right. Another that's when I came to Atlanta. 81 was the first time. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, it I was very different. Wilmington. It was I very from Wilmington, Delaware to Atlanta. Yeah. It was, mm -hmm. it was so big. It was so many people. It was so pedestrian laden. Southern right? charm. It was laid yes. back. A lot of people hadn't discovered it yet. Remember five um, points when you go to work and you come through there, you come through yeah. that corridor. I mean, it was easy to find a job. It was, it was amazing. Yes. And then at, at once everybody discovered it, because I actually came back there a few years ago and I got the hell out of there. I had to come back to LA because it had changed so much. You know, oh, I was looking for the old Atlanta and it was gone. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty thirsty right now, my brother. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a shell of what it used to be. But on the other side of town, you know, be you know, north of 10th Street, you know, things are booming. You know, oh, yeah. You got high rises and you got more cranes out there in the skyline than, than you know, than you do buildings and clouds. You know what I mean? It, the cranes, are they're, they're building. Mm -hmm. And we're, we've been cut out. You know, I live in the south. I live on the south side. So I live in Fayette County, which is, you know, I'm about 12, 15 miles south of the airport. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm up in the woods. But um, my people in Atlanta got left out of the, the big deal. Yeah, yeah. But Dave, I would think that with your, your, the way you talk and your, um, your passion, you know, for the profession, I would have thought that you would have stayed on board and maybe gotten taken a bigger position, you know, to sort of uh, control the, the, the temperature, you know, of the yeah. force. Well, some people are just soldiers. I was just a soldier. I, okay. You know, nobody wanted to fast track me, you know, be a commander. I mean, my wife was a supervisor. She was mm -hmm. a sergeant and a precinct. It wasn't my way. I, I really wanted, I was about service. I really wanted to serve. I figured out how to make these homicides go away. I figured out a formula mm -hmm. with my partner. You know, we, we felt like we were doing really great work. And uh, I couldn't imagine being an administrator. Hmm. Do you I'm miss it? Street leather. Uh, not at all. Hmm. So for me, it was an Elway moment. You know, hmm. uh, it was like having back-to-back -back Super Bowls. You know, you don't go back on that. It was, it was, I'm realizing now that I'm retired, bro, that I did have a lot of stress and just didn't know it. Hmm. You know, you've been able to wash all those years over you of human suffering. Yeah. I don't, I, you know, I'd be swerving to hit, not to hit squirrels these days. You know, I've seen so much death. I don't even carry a, I don't even carry a gun unless I feel, you know, something in the air. I don't, yeah. that's not what I, I'm not strapped up going about my daily activities in my community. Uh, unless it's, in, you know, in the dark, everything changes. I don't care where you live, but I'm not even strapped. And I, I had a gun on me from the time I was 21 years old until mm -hmm. retirement. But I feel, you know, I've made that transition. I'm not, I ain't feeling that, man, at all. Mm. It's, it's not going back to a police department. And they've called me a total of, I think, three times to come back. Mm -hmm. Help them out because the murder rate is, is like unprecedented right now. Mm. Uh, at the rate they're going, last year's numbers hadn't been seen in two decades. Mm. The number of bodies. And uh, now nah, I've, I've seen enough. You got to walk away. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the unrest with, with the police departments around the country? Um, the accusations that it's, you know, there's a lot of racism going on. I'm, 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 this is sort of blanket and I'm, I'm kind of playing, uh, uh, what's the word I want to use? I'm, I'm, I'm acting like I don't know or I don't understand, but I mean, you do know and you've been in there. It's like, are, are these things more prevalent than people think or do um, you think it's exaggerated at times? No, uh, it's two sides of American justice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's two sides. There's, you know, there's the more European side than there's the black and brown side. We mm -hmm. don't get consideration for having a bad day. Mm -hmm. A lot of us black and brown folks, we die when mm -hmm. we're having a bad day. Right. The more European side is given the benefit of the doubt by law enforcement. Mm -hmm. In Atlanta and everywhere else, it's just, there's a fear of people of color and we just have to address it. You know, we, you know, January 6th, you know, it was kid glove time. Yeah. You can say they're outnumbered, but I guarantee you. I know. If that had been some brothers trying to storm yeah. the government. The White House would have been, been red. Bloodletting. It, it would, <laughs> we would change history. We would yeah. change history because that first line of attack would have been decimated. Mm -hmm. And we don't, take time with our black mentally ill like we do our white mentally ill. I'm sorry. I've seen it. I've been there. I used to work police shootings. Me and Ben, that was one of our duties. Uh, we worked police shootings before it was eventually taken over by the state boys mm -hmm. because of the conflict of interest that the public saw. But, you know, in my day, man, if you shot somebody without a gun. You know you're old when you say that, right? In my day, <laughs> you shot somebody and they didn't have a tool on them. Right. When you shot him, he was getting clowned at the office. It just right. wasn't how we did it. Mm -hmm. We used Mutt and Jeff. You yeah. understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And you might be going to Grady, mm -hmm. but you ain't going You, you ain't going to You're going to come out and we'll be able to walk out of there, yeah. Let me tell you something. All the shootouts back in Zone 3, which they called the War Zone, which is where I came up on the police department, they were shootouts. Mm -hmm. Somebody had a gun. They had an axe. They had something that was going to kill you is how they died. Mm -hmm. And we didn't kill everybody with a knife in their hand. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I've had a demented woman one time. We, you know, we just didn't do it. It was like we were cow, we were, we had a little cowboy on us. You know, we mm -hmm. had a little, what they call piss and vinegar. We, 
we tr- we only pulled those guns when it was time to shoot because mm-hmm. you would get the same deadly force levied against you. Mm-hmm. The world has changed, and I'm tell you why it's changed. Not to you know tear your ear off. That's all right. Go ahead. This last 15, 20 years, these kids haven't been allowed to fight. Mm. In school, you go to juvenile. If you get into a fight, you get arrested, you get suspended, you have to go to trial. So you've got a police officer out there that's never been in a fist fight, and you got a potential suspect or whoever's going to jail never been in a fight. So neither one of them can fight. Mm-hmm. It's, these, it's, these, it's these guns that, that resolves everything. I'm just not going to buy because, you know, and we never used to say this thing, brother. Well, I was in fear of my life. I don't know what he had. Oh, that, that was a, that was, that was a non-starter. You, you, you know, you had to see something. I'm sorry. And say, I lost a lot of colleagues, a lot of, you know, I've been to a lot of police funerals. Mm-hmm. Just the way we handled our business. You know, we, we just didn't, I don't know. I, I love police and, uh, I'm just saddened by it's just so easy to kill now. Kill? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what's next for you? I mean, outside of of the TV show, which has done very well, um, it seems like you have more stuff. You still have enough energy to keep going. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't want to lay around. Uh, This is my den here and, you know, made it into an office. I've been writing this book. And oh, I've got okay. one more in me. I don't even know if I can write. I'm just laying it down. You know, I got all these laptops right here. I've been just laying it down. It's a story. Um, the first, you know, gang case ever made in the city that involved a, a series of murders. And it really changed my life uh, working those cases. And uh, I made it, I'm, I'm, I'm writing it into a book. I'm making it into bestseller. a bestseller. We'll see That's what a bestseller. Happens. I don't know. <laughs> Mm. I'm kind of raw, so I, don't, I can only write it raw. I don't, it might be too much. I mean, so you're Donald really, Goins and... Uh, it's, it's really raw. And yeah. it's just, but that's just what happened. And it's about my relationship with an informant that helped, you know, topple this whole gang. Um, he didn't have a father. I was having issues with my son. They were the same age. And now this, it's, it's a crazy story. It's mm-hmm. a crazy story. And uh, I'm just laying it down. Isn't that amazing how we leverage our uh, youth, or we can leverage our youth into, to, and basically turn it into something. I was talking to Frank Ski the other day, or recently, <laughs> oh, and about uh, how he, he did that song, you know, for Cardi B. Uh-huh. And it was something he did like 30 years ago. And an oh. attorney told him how to, you know, make his, make sure nobody copied his music at the time. Beautiful. Had he not, you know, had those things not been ordered, or had that not happened, then he wouldn't have the payday that he had today. But it's really interesting. When you get into your 50s, you, you understand life. You finally get it. It's like, oh, that's why that happened. And that's why that happened. And all those things come to serve you in a sense. So it's just like you writing this book, that's going to help somebody else. And, you know, ultimately, um, you're leveraging. I, I really admire anybody who does that. I mean, even with, you know, uh, pitching the show, you know, and, and uh, telling the stories yes. from your perspective, seeing what was missing you know, and how you could do it better. Um, yeah. That's a that's a really great concept. And I think that, well, you know, go ahead. I don't mean to interrupt you. What we want, and this is our third season, mm-hmm. this is important. We want police to see how it can be done differently. Mm-hmm. I've never seen what we do on TV before. I, I just haven't. Yeah. And so there's a way to connect with the public where people don't feel like they're, snitching right there's a way to connect with the community and people don't feel like you know i'm a lame because i should go ahead and do the life with this joker who i didn't know was going to kill somebody while i was in the car it's you you can't just go in and ask somebody to tell on their buddy mm-hmm. but why do both of y'all need to do life never coming home till you're too old to know who you are mm-hmm. you know how long it takes to, to convince a young man or young lady, a lot of young ladies had to be convinced. You didn't know he was going to kill somebody at the Piggly Wiggly that day. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Why should you do life? Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times we hold it. I'm sorry. We, I got, I got workers, you know, some contractors. That's all right. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I said, why, why should you not raise your child 
and take a chance on this attorney that you think's going to save your life. Mm -hmm. Because, bruh, they only, they pay the same five attorneys. 50 grand a murder case just to go get, just to get convicted. Mm -hmm. And the same people get the same attorneys. It is, it is a hell of a business model. Mm -hmm. But we only see the same, for the big ones, we only see the same ones. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the evidence, why take that chance? You know me, I never shut up. When I get in the witness stand, I'm at home. It's mm -hmm. like I'm in a jacuzzi. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to win that jury. And I'm an expert, me and Vin both, at bringing the truth to a jury so they understand it. Mm -hmm. So why take uh, that chance? Why do that time? So you think, what do you, what do you think that, that causes that? Because I was thinking about that the other day with Ben Crump. It's like he's been popping up a lot lately and all, and all these different cases. Yeah, a lot. What do you, what do you think the, I, I, I fail to understand, do you feel that we actually do care about winning or do you see more of a concept of I don't care what happens? I just, you know. And then it, I mean, you have a lot of people, somebody tells them this is the guy that, can, that gives you your only opportunity and everybody just believes it. Mm -hmm. uh, what Ben is doing, you know, it's more of the civil level. You know, Ben's getting paid. I mean, God bless the brother. Do what you do. Uh, be an advocate for the people. I don't have an issue with it. Uh, he's, he's doing some necessary work out there, but he's mm -hmm. the only face and everybody's going to use him because we like the word of mouth sell. And, uh, that's that's I see only I used to see the same attorneys. Yeah. And everybody picks them. And you were saying they and would they would lose? Lose. We didn't me and Vin didn't lose any cases. I think in in, in out of hundreds of murders, I've lost two at trial mm -hmm. and there were a lot of technical issues. I mean, I was really afraid to lock up the wrong person. I mm -hmm. struggled and agonized just like Vin did. Mm -hmm. We used to sit up at a bar and like, yo, man, I don't know. Well, we don't know. We can't lock him up. You know, mm -hmm. we, we got to both feel this is a hundred percent. It can't be 90. I know people lock folks up and they were 90% sure. I used to have this thing with photographic lineups, which is very controversial, but I know people to get warrants when they ask the person, does this look like the person that shot your friend and killed him? I'm about 90% sure. And they get the, under the law, it's legal. You get the arrest warrant. Mm -hmm. Because they say when you go to trial, they have to do an identification in open court. They got to tell me 100%. Mm -hmm. That's the one I saw do it. Mm -hmm. That was just our mantra. We didn't never do 85s. I mean, because, you know, the law will let you do that mm -hmm. because it is probable cause. Mm -hmm. Funny things happen when the trial starts. It starts going 100 miles an hour as soon as that wide deer and that jury is sworn in. Mm -hmm. And people just come in and point people out because they're trying to get out of the courtroom. Right. Get their $25 and go home. Mm -hmm. It's still $25. Go get their Popeye's chicken sandwich and just <laughs> yeah. go yeah. relax. What and, do you think of some of the other shows I've noticed that um, when they do interrogations, um, it seems that they hold the person for a really long time. It's, it's mostly always black people, black men especially, hold them for a really long time and they they come across with this this fake sympathy like i know you i know you feel bad about the situation i know that you, your heart is hurting and then they pull the chair up and it seems so phony but uh and these are actual cases cuz they have the camera there so it's not it's not uh scripted and then um i'm thinking to myself are they giving away too much information cuz it appears that if the person doesn't admit it during the interrogation that they can't actually charge them well, here's the deal. Everybody, everybody feels like they have a shot until it's their turn. When you get in that room, they call it the box, the interview and interrogation room. That's a scary place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the age range for the people to go in there is like from 16 to 25. That's it. And a lot of scary things can happen in there. And, you know, the law allows cops to do a lot of tricky stuff. Mm -hmm. We are heartstring guys, you know, me and Vin, and we rarely did interviews together because mm -hmm. it was just too much energy. A lot of people noticed that in the show, one will go outside and view from the monitor. 
first of all, I'm just way too gregarious to share that moment. It's too big. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, it may overwhelm somebody because Vinny's personality is different from mine. We always felt like we we're going to overwhelm them. And we, in the car on the way down, whoever that person gravitated to, let them, you know, have a conversation with them. That's who was going to do the interview. We let the guy, the girl pick who was going in the room with him. And by mm -hmm. the time we got back to the station, we already knew. We didn't have to say anything. Well, mm -hmm. like, Vin, he's feeling you, man. You know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to sit back. I'll text you. I'll be watching mm -hmm. and, you know, show you what I see from the box. Mm -hmm. So a lot of egos in homicide. And uh, two guys in the same room sometime, it can look like you're jumping on somebody. But you're allowed to lie to them. You are allowed to lie. I'm not going to sit up here and say I haven't lied to somebody before. Mm -hmm. But as I got older, I didn't like it in court saying, well, you lied to my client. So I would just go to church on them. That was my method. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to bring up your mother. How'd you get raised? You know, you know, you didn't kill this woman's son, this woman's daughter. Mm -hmm. This is some awful stuff. Mm -hmm. What I and what people, the, what, what a lot of things the public, I can't hear you. Go ahead. There's something the public doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. It's hard for some people to sleep at night with after they've killed someone because they keep seeing them. And I didn't know that for like ten years. Really? Is that what most of the? Is that what most of them tell you? I started finding out in my twilight years working murder. Mm -hmm. Once I got really close to these people. And, you know, because sometimes you're with them for several hours because processing takes a long time after the fact, and they start talking to you. Now, when they go to trial, they're going to say it was coercion, you know, you tricked the film. But I, I taped, we taped every time we did a bathroom break. Sometimes I've taken people down to the weight room. We did some, you know, you know we did some bench presses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As, long <laughs> as, they got ankle chain, as long as they got ankle chains on, I'm good. You know, yeah. always order whatever they ask to eat. We eat together. You know, we say our grace, things like that. People want to get it off their chest. Now, by the time it goes to trial a year later, that wasn't me. I wasn't there. And, you know, but it's all on video. Mm -hmm. It's like they, this is the, the one thing that happens every time you finish an interview. Folks go to sleep. He just gave up a murder. Now he can sleep. And it started coming. I was so ignorant to the this. The peace of mind? I think so. I was so ignorant to this. And some some old some older guy told me, he said, I just want to be able to sleep. And I was like, damn, everybody's not cold. Because like I said, they don't wake up saying I'm going to kill somebody. Mm -hmm. They wake up saying I'm going to get some money. Mm. And it turns into that. So, yeah. But I you have also come that. across the, the kind of people who can sleep. Oh, yeah. Mm. It's a lot of them because it's just business. Right. And that, oh, that's scary, you know. Just business. Yeah. Oh, you got to go because he owes me, you know, he shorted me on half a bird. Mm. You know what I mean? Half a kilo. I mean, it's crazy. But there's some folks out there, they believe in them codes because they grew up in the game. Oh, yeah, it's nothing to them. Have you, what was the most ridiculous uh, homicide you ever came across where somebody was killed for something for the stupidest reason? God. I've had some he stepped on my foot homicides. Mm. You know, I've had some... Uh, Oh God, I've had just that sudden rage mm -hmm. over nothing because somebody said something to me at the club. Mm -hmm. it, it, and, and these people, they don't realize, I used to say, I guess I coined this phrase, I guess about seven or eight years ago, these jokes out here playing Vice City. Mm -hmm. They lay up, you know, in their grandmother's house all day or the mama's house playing these video games. They're killing people all day long. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't even, I was on a crime scene where somebody was dead and what was playing on the TV was that uh, Grand Theft Auto, one of those, those video games. I hate to be you know, giving up the names of these things, but those really violent video games. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen it before. And I'm looking at this. I'm, so this is what everybody's doing. They're sitting around playing these games. And now they transition out to the street. They've got a nine millimeter in their, in their waistband and they're, they're going to the store to play a number or whatever. It just seems so easy. Are you still seeing a lot of uh, negative activity at the clubs? I mean, like uh, a lot of violence, even, even yeah. now? Really? Yeah, yeah. there has been an uptick. Yeah, the, the violence is crazy here now. Uh, 
people getting shot for little or nothing. Tons and tons of carjackings mm -hmm. left and right. Um, but again, we're metropolitan, so I'm, I'm way outside. You know, if you want to go down there at night, and I have a daughter that, you know, works downtown, just came out of college, so she's working down there. And right now, the only way you keep crime down is being proactive, being out there. Like I said, when I first started, my car would be right in front of the bodega all night long. Mm -hmm. You wanted to get this before cell phones. You knew I was in the middle of the madness where the dice game was going on. That's where I was. That kept people from shooting each other at the dice game. Mm -hmm. And after a while, they said, Queen, you want to play? I mean, it was like that mm -hmm. because I was so connected to community. They got to they win. They got to win these neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. But is that That's possible where they assign the wrong police officers to these neighborhoods? Yeah. I mean, we've heard that a lot of times, too, that the, yeah, usually right, the rookies well, go into the black neighborhoods. Is that true? Um, yeah, you, you're going to go in there. I mean, most of the neighborhoods are black neighborhoods. You know, you have your gentrified areas, which are in transition. Uh, you've got somebody paying $7 a month for rent and just... 50 feet away, somebody's got a condo, it costs 750,000. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're right there. Mm -hmm. That's what Atlanta is. So um, as far as picking who goes to the neighborhood, that's something we never had to really worry about. I guess they have to start considering it now mm -hmm. because no matter where you were from back in the day, in the mm -hmm. 80s, it was almost as if the seasoned officer showed you how to operate there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's going on. Mm -hmm. The seasoned guy told me the tone and tenor of the neighborhood I was being assigned to. All right, here's how this goes. Boom. That's the gambling house. All right. They run every night from 10 o'clock p.m. to 4 a.m. Everybody over there is cool. They're not bothering anybody. Let them do what they do. They, you know. You had a mentor. Yeah. They would just, Essentially, yeah. And so the next guy, after that guy moves on and gets promoted, now I've been there five years dripped in this stuff. Now I'm doing it to this guy. Mm -hmm. But see, this generation doesn't really listen to anybody that's their contemporary. It's mm -hmm. got to be somebody that's above them. When in fact, the real street cop, because they cycle so many of these cops out so fast, they don't let them become part of the neighborhood. Nobody's going to work a beat for 10 years like me. A decade mm -hmm. riding the same neighborhood, that's gone. That'll never happen again. Mm -hmm. But that was the standard when I came on. Mm -hmm. You get your beat car a decade before you started moving up, you know, getting upwardly mobile transitions like detective or going to the SWAT team. You did no, no more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. That's over. 